Our next speaker is going to be Steve Chamberlain. He's going to be talking about financial crimes. Uh, Steve has a bar number of 2007. How far is bar number for that? No, it's 06. 06. Okay, 06 in California, 07 in Oregon. Uh, he's been with us for nine, eight years. Um, he's had the longest probation probably of any deputy DA uh, that's ever worked here. Uh, he's sometimes still on it. Uh, he's a USC grad, which is part of the reason. Um, he originally came from Tigard, but went south for whatever reason. Uh, his dad was a fireman. Um, he's now a senior deputy with us, which is uh, truly amazing. Uh, he, spent, <laughs> he spent four years in the L.A. County DA's office. I remember when I saw Steve's resume, he worked for Tom Cruise and Al Pacino. And I started laughing when I was reading his resume, and then I finally saw L.A. County DA's office, and I saw why he had applied. But uh, otherwise, it, I, I was expecting to introduce Tom Cruise, actually, uh, when he showed up. Um, I think it, the only reason he left L.A. County because his uh, pass at the Playboy Mansion finally got uh, punched because of something Cosby did. But he won't, <laughs> he, he won't talk about that. So... <laughs> Without further ado, and I wanted to point out that uh, we put Steve right between Judge Brownhill and right judge, between Judge McIntosh for a real reason. So, anyhow, <clears throat> they'll keep an eye on it. Steve. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, apparently, I'm not having a mouth. Yeah, I know. Um, I know on the sheet it says financial crimes and guns, and for all of you who love guns as much as I do, no guns. Sorry, it's just financial crimes. <laughs> uh, but if you have gun questions uh, and we have time, you can ask Steve. Okay. Anyway, uh, financial crimes, I want to thank Deputy, or sorry, Detective Dersham, I just demoted you, um, and DOJ. They did help with this. Uh, I want to cover some issues about subpoenas, especially with financial crimes, as we get to near the end. There's uh, some weird stuff with the subpoenas, but we'll go over it when we get there. Um, some of the financial crimes that you guys are going to start seeing, or that you do see, uh, the guys that have been around, your criminal possession of a forged instrument, your computer crime, forgery, fraudulent use of a credit card, identity theft, and on identity theft, think broadly. There's a lot of things that come into play here. Uh, you get somebody with, a, you pull over, gives you a false information, just giving you the fake name isn't going to be enough, but if they give you an ID of somebody else, They've given you personal identifying information. They've uttered it to you with the intent to fraud. And we'll get into that. Uh, mail theft, money laundering. I don't think I've ever seen one out here, but that's one of the crimes. RICO, I just had my first one out here. It's very powerful. It's a great charge if you can prove it. And then obviously that. Um, your criminal possession of a forged instrument. These are the two, the misdemeanor and the felony. Essentially, a person knowingly possesses a forged instrument with the intent to utter. That by itself is a misdemeanor. And then when you take it to specific items, like money, stocks, documents, uh, checks, something over $1,000, or for retail, you've got 15 or more receipts, you bump it up into the felony land. Your issue in this, you're going to need to show that when they uttered it, that they knew it was forged. So a lot of times, that's going to be your problem. You want to look how to solve that. Computer crime. This is a great one. It's very, very broad. Just computer crime seems kind of boring. But it's a person knowingly accesses, attempts to access, or uses, attempts to use any computer, computer system, network, or any part of as a scheme to defraud, obtain money or services, or commit theft. It's a felony. So when you've got a knucklehead that takes a stolen credit card and swipes that handy dandy little slider at the uh, countertop when they're buying stuff, it's computer crime. It's a repeat property offense and it's prison time if they've got enough. Uh, so always think about it when you've got somebody, say, going to an ATM, using a credit card or anything like that. Uh, it's, a, it's a great charge. Forgery, um, pretty straightforward. The misdemeanor and the felony. Person with the intent to injure, defraud a person, makes, completes, alters a written instrument or utters the same. That's the misdemeanor. If it's certain documents,
payments, money, stocks, uh, wills, checks, credit cards over $1,000, then you bump it up to a felony. Your issue in that case is did the person know it was forged? A lot of times, this is your counterfeit case. And I'll cover that one a little bit later, but please keep the money. That's largely how we're going to tell it's forged. Feds won't give it back. Yeah. Um, Don't give it to them. Fraudulent use of a credit card. Um, a person with the intent to injure or defraud uses a credit card for the purpose of obtaining property or services, knowing the card is stolen, for revoked. Under $1,000, it's a misto. Over $1,000, it's a felony. Your issue in that case is did they know the card was forged? Did they know it had been canceled? They couldn't use it. So that's what you're going to want to have solved when you bring it to us. And please consider that anytime somebody's using a card that doesn't belong to them. Identity theft. This is the broad one. This one's a person with the intent to deceive or defraud obtains, possesses, transfers, creates, utters, or converts to the person's own use the personal identification of another person. So your issue is, did they do it with the intent to defraud? And at least have that one figured out before you bring it to us. But this is any case where somebody uses somebody's personal identifying information with the intent to defraud. And that personal identifying information is very, very broad. A you know, person's address, their date of birth, their account numbers on the bottom of the check, their name. It's, it's this very, very broad thing, and you bring it to us, there's a lot we can do with it. So think about that when you see somebody using this sort of identification. Mail theft. Somebody takes mail. It's where they took it from. And again, the law is very broad here. Did they take it from the post office? Did they take it from somebody's um, post box that they have out in front of their house? You know, where was it taken from? Anytime you see somebody caught with uh, mail belonging to someone else, think about this. Money laundering. I'm not going to spend much on this. Uh, I haven't seen one. I don't think I, any of the DAs I spoke with have seen one since I've been here. Basically, it's going to be your large conspiracy. If somebody is using money to uh, promote an unlawful activity, and they do it with the intent to conceal the crime. So, RICO. I just have my first one, uh, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But anytime you have somebody acting with a uh, pattern of racketeering activity, um, it's unlawful for that person to be employed with, associated with any sort of enterprise um, to conduct or participate directly or indirectly with that pattern of activity. Uh, and the pattern of activity can be very, very broad. Recently, I had this girl who was essentially going with a bunch of different people. They were stealing mail, getting credit cards, getting checks, um, going to banks, and they'd get somebody to put money into an account, and then they would draw it right away, and they'd go buy a bunch of drugs. So working together with a bunch of different people. So I'll explain in a minute. Here he is. And the judge gets to pick where on the felony sentencing grid block that person is going to fall. So it can be, it can have a lot of impact. You get a lot of prison time on this case. Theft. Uh, yes, any sort of pattern of criminal activity. Uh, theft. Person takes property with the intent to deprive. Obviously, you know, under 100, over 100, under 1,000. The one you really want to look at is in the financial crimes. You want to look at the age of your victim. If you've got a victim over the age of 65, and the person taking over $10,000, the elder abuse for Oregon. And in that, we're also looking at prison. So find out the age of your victim if you think they're in that, that Ron Brown, kind of over 65. Over 65 till October, Probation continues. Uh, Anyway, those are pretty serious. That's what you want to look for. So the woman I was just referring to, one Miss Desiree Shell, which I don't know an agency in here with the exception of OSP that was not involved. She hit everybody. 
But the one instance I want to talk about, uh, March 9th of 2018, she was right over here at Wells Fargo. She was there with Travis Eddy. They went into the Wells Fargo. Travis Eddy had just opened up a bank account there. He has a check with him. He walks up to the teller with Michelle, writes out a check, signs it, or it was, sorry, it was already signed, endorsed it. The bank's like, eh, this account's been closed, a little fishy. So they send them away. APD responds. And as she's walking out, they catch Travis with the bogus check and Michelle, who's standing with him. Mr. Eddie is arrested on the warrant that he has. Outside, they find uh, Marvell Williams in a van waiting to take Mr. Eddie and uh, Michelle off to buy drugs. Well, they talk with Miss Williams and they find that Michelle's backpack is right there. So they seize her backpack. And they seize her, say Michelle or Miss Michelle? Miss Shell. <laughs> Sorry. Inside Desiree Shell's backpack, they find six different checkbooks. Three belong to victim A, three belong to victim B. They also find 17 pieces of mail. They find five uh, victims' personal identifying information, credit cards, debit cards, uh, ODLs, and the like. 12 checks happen to be written out. Um, several of them are written out to Travis Eddy. And for those of you that worked on it, the word dollars was spelled D-O-L-L-O-R-S. Desiree Shell likes to spell it that way. But anyway, um, several checks were written out to several of her other compatriots that are involved in this RICO activity. And the one that Travis Eddy was carrying belonged to one of the victim's checkbooks that were found in Ms. Shell's possession. So the investigation, since the crime took place at the bank, start at the bank. Go right back in, ask for the video. If the bank won't give you the video, at least ask them to preserve it. Then you want to talk to the teller. Find out what they did. Was the check signed in front of the teller? You know, who was, was the female standing back? It was all the mail. Was the female directing the mail? That sort of thing. You want to get everything you can from that teller. You want to get copies from the bank of Mr. Eddie's application because he had just opened the bank account there. You also want to get copies of the check um, and any ID that you pass that check. Because sometimes not only will they have a stolen check, but they'll have a stolen ID to match that check. And maybe they created it, or maybe it's an actual real one. And then sometimes if you don't have the person right there, a lot of times the banks are requiring fingerprints, a thumb or whatever. Get a copy of that if he'll give it to you. Because if ID is a question, that's huge. Next, you've got to notify the victims. All those 17 pieces of mail that were found, you've got to call each person. And you want to obtain their statement, and especially with those debit cards, those credit cards. How was your card lost? Do you know these people? In a couple of the cases with Desiree, there happened to have been, there was a burglary in Warrington, there was a burglary in Seaside, uh, and we could prove that she was involved with those as part of this racketeering scheme. So we could charge her with not only the identity theft and the RICO, but I could charge her with burglary as well. Uh, again, the victim. Had they given permission, you know, oh, okay, it's all right for Desiree Shell to have my mail and my checkbook. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but you know, maybe somebody is that stupid. Uh, and then you're gonna wanna determine if that check was used anywhere else or the cards were used anywhere else. You're gonna want the victim to uh, run a credit history. Because maybe somebody opened up new credit cards. Um, and if the victim's information was used, say Marvell Williams takes the, the credit cards or something that Shell had in her uh, backpack and goes over to Warrington to five separate 
stores, Super Mart, whatever this actually had. Um, and it starts using the bogus ID at multiple locations, you're going to want to follow up with each of those stores. Uh, you're going to want to obtain the video, if there is. If there isn't video, you got to talk to the tellers, the clerks, get their statements, do the photo lineups. I know you guys hate those things, but they're, they're great because if you bring it to us and we can't identify who did it, it kind of leaves us, you know, okay, what do I do now? So, you're also going to want to look at the, what process. You know, with the, was it a check? Was it a credit card? If it's a credit card, did they swipe that little machine or is it one of those old school stores that actually runs that thing across with the carbon copies? There's one or two that are still in Hammond that may do that. It seems like, Steve, we get a lot of times uh, where uh, the witness says they did this and they did that that came up and then the defense down the road is that the male made the female do all of the acts that she did and so she's under duress. So I, I think that shows just how important you need to have the uh, individual actions recorded uh, if you can. Absolutely. It does defeat that argument uh, because if you have, like in my case with Marvell Williams, just walking into the supermarket and walking into all these on her own and nobody else around her, it's really tough for her to say, oh, that guy had a gun to my head and was making me do it. So, um, and one of the other things you want to do is obtain that receipt. So if they go into another location, like with Marvell Williams, get the receipt from the supermarket because that really helped out when they caught up to Marvell later. One of the specific items that she purchased was this weird funky little lighter. She had that weird funky little lighter in her possession. So it just helps tying things up with a nice little bow. Um, contact the banks, and we're gonna get into the subpoena process here in a little bit. But when you contact the banks, I know all the big banks have these fraud departments. And as much as the banks don't want to give you anything because of the privacy interests of their customers, their fraud departments will actually work with you. Um, talk to the fraud department. They'll at least direct you who you need to talk to, what they want, how you can provide them what they need so you can get what you want. Because um, you're going to want any sort of bank statements, and you're going to want them to preserve the video. Those are going to be your two key things that you got to get. Um, after you have this, that's what I would suggest talking to the victim, I mean to the defendant, sorry. And you want to lock that defendant into some sort of statement, if they'll talk to you. Get as much information as you can. And will that play? It's a video? All right, never mind. I'll do it. Um, so Deputy Chris Anderson uh, did a wonderful job. Desiree Shell, I had 40 some odd cases that came to me that we would compile. And in this one case, Deputy Anderson just kept talking to Shell and just kept talking. And in this instance, she had, it was 100, and, no, it's 65 different pieces of mail from 65 victims mail that she had in her possession. She kept denying, I don't steal mail, I don't steal mail. This is what I do. And she finally stood up and she told Debbie Anderson, this is what I do. I get checks, I get checkbooks, I steal them, I go to the banks with these people, I, we open accounts, we write checks, we deposit them, we take the money out, I give $100 here, $1,000 here, I keep the rest, and we go all get a bunch of drugs and get loaded. And she told this to Deputy Anderson. He was patient, he kept talking to her, and she just, I'm not a male thief, I'm not a male thief. But she laid out her RICO scam just perfect. And she ended up getting charged with 145 counts. Um, count number one, RICO. She took 10 years on a plea deal, 10 years. So he can be very powerful. Um, another case that I have, um, Yvonne Hughes. 
Miss Hughes is, uh, a, well, was a local. Um, she ran into an elderly male in our community, and <laughs> I don't want permanent probation. Um, oh, sorry. Anyway, my, uh, my victim was over 65 years old, and he hires her to work for him to help out at $20 an hour. Being what he believed to be a young, semi-attractive woman, she came to him one day for a little extra, you know, because of some financial issues she was having. So he wrote her a personal check to give her a little bit of money. In fact, he typed it up quite nicely. Um, and that happened on three other occasions. What this wonderful woman did is after she got the four checks, she went out and got herself a Capital One card. And with that Capital One card, when she set it up, uh, she did so via what's called an ATH system, the Automated Clearinghouse, which essentially directs both payment information and personal information from one bank to another um, to have her credit card bill paid for by this elderly gentleman's bank account. So, really, really nice lady. Um, now, my victim ends up being in the hospital for her six, seven months for the 10 months that she's stealing from him. Uh, they didn't even realize that it was going on, actually, because of all the medical issues that he was having. It wasn't until he got out of the hospital that his uh, family noticed that there was roughly $50,000 missing from his account. So they called the police and informed the police. So you've got a 65 plus year old male that you need to interview. You gotta get a statement, but because of his age, you're gonna want to video that. And while you're videoing, while you're talking to him, one of the main things you're gonna be looking at besides the information about what happened is his mental competency. Does this person really grasp what's going on? Are they aware of going on? Because nine times out of 10, the defense in this case is going to be, I had permission and he just forgot. So do they know, are they able to appreciate what's going on? Can they articulate the facts that you need to appreciate that there was a crime that has occurred? So you're gonna to wanna to look at that. Um, and then since this guy was in the hospital, obviously the officer talked to the family. Why was he in the hospital? You know, was it Alzheimer's? Was it dementia? Something along those lines. In my case, uh, it was heart issues. So, uh, and he was able to articulate with specificity what had occurred. So, what are you gonna want? You gotta contact the victim's accounts. So you wanna get the statements. Because you gotta track where she's spending the money and what she's buying. So again, contact the fraud unit. Because more likely than not, if this sort of case goes to trial, I'm going to need somebody as a custodian of records from that bank who can come testify. And a person from the fraud department, your contact is most likely going to be the best option. Depending on how big the account or how big the crime is, you're going to probably want to do a forensic accounting. In my case, I had 10 months. Um, it was close. I know this is boring, guys. We'll get there. Um, the other thing you want to consider, does your victim have somebody that has a power of attorney? Or is there somebody that's a caregiver that's responsible for them? Because when you go to get their information, you're obviously going to be asking for their consent to get their records. But if you do so, you want to be concerned about the fact or aware of the fact you might be alert, alerting your suspect. Because if your suspect is the caregiver or the family member with the power of attorney, they may be the one that's stealing from them. That's just something you want to keep in your mind. So in this case, we had to go to the defendant's accounts. So um, we wanted to get her application because she set up that Capital One credit card. And how did she set it up? And how did she provide or what information did she provide 
of my victims to set up that ACH system because basically that ACH just automatically takes money out of my victim's account and puts it into her account every time she makes a payment. All she has to do is a click of her thumb from her little app on her phone. Uh, you want the statements, and in our case, she was utilities, she was paying her phone bill, and then every other little thing that she spent her credit card on, which was basically everything, groceries, pizza, coffee. She was living off this guy for 10 months. Um, and then if she was making purchases at stores, you want to go out to those stores, you want to try to get video if at all possible, you want to interview uh, the personnel at the store. If they don't have video, again, that uh, photo ID. They're a lot of work. Um, and one thing that you might want to look at, and Bo suggested this, because he had this on one of his cases, uh, a pretext phone call. Get your victim to call the, the suspect. Uh, a lot of times they'll give you something along the lines of like what Bo had. Uh, well, I didn't take it, but I'll pay it all back. So, I mean, come on. And, and Steve, I, uh, what about the ones where the, the person uh, does have kind of a shaky me uh, mental history? Would you use a different family member, some reliable person that knows what's going on or that has some idea what's going on? You know, that's going to depend on the facts of your case. But absolutely, that would be something to consider. Um, unfortunately, in my case, because the only person that was dealing with her was my victim, um, even though it was the family that came in later and found everything, I probably wouldn't do that uh, because she just suspected right off the bat that somebody else was calling. But that's absolutely a good way to go. So use whatever resource that you have at your fingertips. Um, and just so you know, Ms. Hughes was count, uh, charged with one count of aggravated theft, eight counts of theft in the first degree, nine counts of aggravated identity theft, ten counts of computer crime. Uh, day of call for trial, she did not show, and she has been in the wind. The U.S. Marshals are actually trying to track her down. She's looking at a lot of prison time with no history. So these financial crime cases can have a big impact. You can definitely get a lot of prison time. How much charges did you rip this guy for? About 50000 I think it was $52,000. So, um, like I said, they can have a lot of impact. And, of course, that video isn't going to work either. This was to wake Nofi up. All right. Pardon? Oh, I did it on my own. And just so you know, the last thing I did in the film industry was make visual effects. <laughs> did that for two years. But you couldn't tell by this. All right, so we'll just skip that. Uh, counterfeit money cases. This is your person who shows up at the stop and go with a bogus 20 or your bogus 100. Um, our big issue with these is you guys like to send the money to the Secret Service. And nine times out of ten, the way we're going to be able to determine that it was forged or that they knew it was forged when they uttered it is when you look at that bill. Because those bills, they're going to have Chinese markings on them. They're not going to have the strips. They're going to feel like just regular plain old paper that the Department of Treasury gets from Vermont. So save the bill. You can get it to them later. How much does the Fed really do on counterfeiting anymore? It just depends. Uh, sometimes uh, I think we had a case with a $100 bill. The Feds were interested because it uh, later determined the bill or whatever with that being circulated a lot of places. So they took an interest. But if you get a basic 20, they just send us the money. They're not going to do anything. But that means our case, without having the ability to prove that the person knew it was forged or making it incredibly difficult for us to prove that, it's pretty much out the window. But, yeah, because it, it, it helps to talk to them so we know whether or not they take it. But I had a 20 that they weren't going to do anything with. But they did send somebody to come and testify that it, I mean, you could touch it and know it wasn't real, but it still helps to have someone. Well, it's, but it's also really helpful to the jury 
when they can see it, they can hold it. Yes? So we're working in case we had 360 employees at Walmart a couple weeks ago, and Seaside on a Saturday had to pay 20 stamps a couple of their stores actually contacted the suspects who matched our video at Walmart, and they said that they sold some perfume on offer up. This is what they were paid. So now we got all these different stores where they're passing all these bills, and they would put down some 20s, and they put a real $10 bill because it would be like $92 or something. And so they'd see the fresh, you know, the good 10, and these are actually really good 20s. And Walmart says, no, we need to keep these. I said, no, here's your receipt thing, but they weren't going to give, give us the bills at Walmart. So we're working that case right now. Uh, yeah, that's, that's actually a good follow-up because that helps to show that why are they, you know, they're running because they're aware of the fact that it's forged. Those are the things you want to all want to look for because if you get a, you get a bill that may look, have that security stripe and have everything, have the texture and still be bogus and somebody may have that exact argument that, look, I thought it was real. This is how I got it. You're going to have to defeat that argument. So you're going to want to look at, start going after their accounts. Where'd they do that? On PayPal, you know, on eBay? They said they sold some perfume on offer up and they got $140. Well, so if they got $140 and they spent how much at Walmart and how much at Seaside? Just three different? Okay, and well, if they're spending $500, it kind of defeats that $140 on offer up. So. And also, um, you guys may want to contact the Secret Service because having one of them come and testify. I did. They didn't call back. There's only two it is in fact. Oregon. Yeah. Uh, and there I had another wonderful video. So, another one for Nofi. All right. Um, how am I doing on time, Ron? Oh, I have about uh, another 10 minutes. All right. Well, then we're going to skip Bo's case. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so obtaining financial records. This is uh, getting into your subpoenas. Big thing you're going to want is consent. Um, this is with your victim. You're going to uh, need to ask them for consent uh, and anyone else who is attached to that account. So if you have, uh, like in my case, a, a victim, an elderly gentleman, he was the uh, beneficiary of a trust that held that account. So we had to get the executor and everybody else that was named on that account. Everybody has to consent. Um, and if you run into that issue where, hey, um, the caregiver, the power of attorney is my suspect, you may not want to go into your victim because your victim, you want to know why they have somebody that's overseeing. Usually it's going to be your dementia, your, you know, your mental health issue that somebody's overseeing their financial information for them. So you may not want to go consent because you don't, may not want to alert your suspect. So obtaining financial records pursuant to a subpoena, it's ORS 192-596. Um, and these financial institutions are allowed to disclose records uh, to law enforcement pursuant to a subpoena. Now, you do have to notify your suspect when you're getting a subpoena. And your financial institution is going to hold that request for 10 days, giving that suspect 10 days to um, object so that the subpoena doesn't have to be uh, filled. Now, there is a way beyond that. ORS 192-596 sub 6 allows you to do what's called a non-disclosure petition, an affidavit to get an order for the court. Now, a subpoena requires you to do an affidavit, the petition, whether you want to do a non-disclosure order, uh, then you'll be doing your grand jury subpoena, and that's got to be in the county for which the crime occurred, and you have to have reasonable cause. Now, the reasonable cause is directly to your non-disclosure. Your non-disclosure petition and uh, affidavit that you're going to file with the court so you file it with the judge, that way we don't get you guys subject to any civil liability. And the court can say, 
hey, there is reasonable cause not to disclose your reasonable cause for this uh, subpoena. It's a lower threshold than probable cause. And that way it waives the fact that you no longer have to serve the suspect. You don't have to wait the 10 days and then just send it directly uh, to you for your grand jury. Now, the other way to obtain financial records is via search warrant. So your search warrant, affidavit, your search warrant, you may want to do a non-disclosure, your return, and you have to have probable cause. So you, look, you have to look at what facts you have for your specific case, whether getting a subpoena is going to be the right way or whether you want to actually go with a search warrant. Now, in certain cases, if the financial institution is your victim, they can provide, pursuant to ORS 192.603, um, they can provide the information directly to uh, law enforcement. So if you come across that circumstance where Wells Fargo, B of A, is your victim, I know that's hard to believe, Wells Fargo would be your victim, but it happens. Um, and they will be more than happy to give all their information. Right. Um, okay. So in elder abuse cases under ORS 192.597, this allows, uh, provided you have the proper um, requirements, that you can just get a grand jury subpoena um, and you don't need the affidavit, you don't need the petition or the court order, and they can send it directly to a uh, grand jury for, uh, for review. Um, it doesn't require that the victim be notified, the caretaker, or the legal representative, but your subpoena must specify uh, the name, the social security of the person, uh, the person who uh, is the alleged victim. The person is alleged victim of abuse under ORS 124.070 or ORS 4 for 1650. So you'll need to look at those to make sure you're in compliance. Um, lastly, or not close to lastly, I'm trying to hurry so I don't take up your honor's time. Um, what you're going to want to ask for when you're doing these subpoenas, these bank companies, um, the account applications, specifically like with Ms. Hughes, it, it really showed what information was being used so they can be incredibly helpful. Any sort of signature cards, because if you've got you know, bogus signatures or you've got Desiree Shell writing dollars with ORS, um, you don't want the monthly statements to show, you know, so you can see really what's going on. You want the deposits, the withdrawals, all debits, offsets um, with the bank of first deposit. And offset might be a new word for a lot of you. It was for me when I was reviewing this stuff. Um, but offsets, or what are offsets, can be huge. Be the checks, be copies of the endorsement on the back of the checks. Um, it can be deposit slips, and a lot of that stuff, which is really, really helpful in your case. That's what I with the banks. With the banks, yes. You'll want offsets in your subpoena. Use that verbiage. Um, all credits, fund transfers, wire transfers, um, ATM transactions, uh, photos, and a lot of times the banks will actually give you the ATM photos as well as the photos from inside the bank of the person with the teller. Uh, they also make recorded phone calls to their clients and they will provide those if you ask for them. Uh, any sort of safety deposit applications or communications, uh, sometimes those are relevant, you might want those. Uh, but they can provide, that's just another source of information that you can be looking at. Now, um, these documents are, I obtained a bunch of these documents from DOJ, the notice, the petition for the non-disclosure, the subpoenas from the grand jury, um, some through Detective Dersham, some through DOJ. I have sent them out to representatives from each of your agencies. So if you need them, if you run into a financial crime and you need to get this sort of documentation, these are your contacts uh, at each of your agencies. Additionally, if you want any help 
Michael Korchek at DOJ, he's a financial crimes investigator. He's been doing this for a long time. Um, he really, really knows what's going on and is, is good with these subpoenas and that especially. Uh, he is more than happy to help um, and would love to hear from you. That's his email on the bottom. Feel free to contact him if you've got any uh, questions or concerns, or please feel free to contact us. And should I stop giving the, Your Honor enough time? <laughs>